right, we're going to wait a few minutes until a few more people join, and we'll get started. <laughs> bye, bye, June. <laughs> we, have, we, have a, we have a furry one. Hi, Cassie. Hi, Cassie. Hi, Stephanie. Hi. Hey, Cassia. All right. Hello. Yay. That's amazing. What, which places uh, many people is in are in this event? 18. Okay, I found it. Ah. Awesome. We'll wait two more minutes and then yeah. we'll get started. Some people are just getting off of work. <laughs> Commuting to home. De depending depending <laughs> on yeah <laughs> where you are, right? Yeah. If you are in the living room, if you're in the bathroom, <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like if you're in the bedroom, you know, like it depends on like how many rooms you have in your apartment. Like uh, <laughs> <laughs> who's mi who's missing commuting like you know what i mean like uh, that I part am, i am i am missing it a lot it, it gives you a break right like i feel like i just roll out of bed and then i'm like in front of the computer uh so it's like, like the subway like, though yeah, yeah. you miss the subway I, I do miss it I mean, I'll take, I've been taking it all my life, so it's a uh, sure. It's something that you miss showtime. That's what you miss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If New Yorkers know what showtime is. Yeah. Hi, Fisher. Hi, welcome. Showtime is still happening, Angela. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right. Yeah, it is. I mean. What do you all think? Should we get started? Yeah, let's get started. All right. Um, Connie, before your intro, I just want to mention that if anyone wants captions, they have to turn it on themselves. It's in your menu bar at the bottom, and you just press the button saying turn on captions. OK. All right, well, we're going to get started. Um, and uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, and for those of you who are new to BYOC, Bring Your Own Color, um, we are your hosts, Yummy Colors. That is myself, along with our co-founders, Denise and Diego, um, and our small but mighty team, Crystal, Katie, and Bridget. Um, we are a creative studio based in New York. Uh, we are designers of experiences and articulators of brands. But, you know, tonight is not about us, so enough about us. Um, everyone is here for our very first uh, virtual YC Lab BYOC. YC Lab is actually a division of Yummy Colors that uh, is devoted to affecting social and environmental change with, within the creative industry. 
And BYOC is a series of conversations around themes that we are very passionate in learning more about. And more importantly, we believe as creatives, we have great responsibility in what we create, how we create it, and with whom we create it with. Um, and it is important for us to continue to learn from and share with the community information, tools, uh, languages, resources, so that we can all work better and make better work. So welcome to Beyond Accessibility. And I will now hand it over to Diego to say a few words. So Diego, take it away. Let me unmute and yeah, so for people that has, have participated before, they know that this format is slightly different, right? And like uh, when, when we were doing it in person, it was in our office and everyone was sitting on the floor and it's it started this idea started like uh from from the fact that we went to a lot of talks and speech and stuff and we were all like frustrated by the fact that like you know like it's super interesting topics super interesting speaker and after you have three questions at the end and that's it you know there's no like interaction between people and there's no like going in depth and also hearing from other perspective and other point of view so we started like uh, BYOC, bring your own color to create conversation rather than, you know, speaking about. And so we invite every time uh, two moderators, not even like uh, speakers. There are people who are like, um, they are like uh, expert in their field. And in this case is Jessica uh, over there and like uh, Helen. Uh, Jessica is a designer and Alan is a writer. And so Jessica and Alan will moderate this conversation that will take place in a slightly different way uh, this time. So if you have any question, Denise is gonna go through after put it in the, in the chat. And, uh, but we encourage participation, right? So when, raise your hand, raise your digital hand, do something, you know, but ask a lot of questions because it's the only way that we learn from different point of view. Uh, one more, one last point is like, you know, again, uh, because we are here to learn, we're probably saying or doing something, you know, wrong and we embrace wrong. So like we are here to make mistake is a safe space, you know, as soon as we, you know, respect each other opinions and we respect each other, like, you know, like point of views, uh, is a safe space. So don't be afraid to ask the question that you have in mind. And like, you know, we will, we will, not we, uh, Jessica and Ellen will, you know, like guide you through the right, through the right uh, answer. So again, I remind people to be, you know, like speak in high terms and being like, you know, respectful on the things, but speak your mind. And if you don't know, you don't know, you know, like be honest and, uh, and go for that. And I pass it to Denise for like some housekeeping uh, on that on that note. Hey everyone, welcome. Um, I'm just gonna go over a few practical notes. The first one is that this event is being recorded and by participating, you're giving Yami Kalas consent to doing so. We emailed you the full consent and waiver in the email that we sent out this morning. Um, if you didn't uh, receive it, Crystal is also gonna paste it into the chat area now. Um, if you don't want to be recorded, um, you will have to either log off or you can just turn off your cameras and stay on mute so you just get to listen in. Um, speaking of mute, please keep yourself on mute unless called upon to unmute yourself. Um, if you have a question, please write it in the chat space and please write out the full question and not just I have a question. Um, and note that as opposed to other meeting platforms, every participant can see the full chat. Um, throughout the presentation, Jessica and Helen will make space to, um, to answer questions. And when they do so, uh, Diego and I will call upon people who have asked a question in the chat. Um, the presentation recording and transcript will be available early next week. So if you would like to receive a copy, please sign up for our newsletter. Um, the sign up form is also going to be pasted into our chat section um, now. 
Uh, I already mentioned the captioning, but if you arrived um, after that, uh, just note that you have to turn it on manually and it's at the bottom of your screen um, to the right of the gray menu bar. Um, Diego already mentioned, please speak in I terms. Um, also try to keep the topics within the design world. As with all the BYOC events, the topics that we pick are enormous and by no means can we um, uh, cover, cover them. So we choose to um, focus on the design world. Um, and that's all for me. So let's hand it over to Jessica and Helen. Amazing, I will set up the presentation. Alrighty. So YC Lab presents Beyond Accessibility, BYOC, featuring, I am Jess, Jessica. Um, my pronouns are she, her. A little bit about me. I'm going to do a little description of me right now on the screen. I have long brown hair, uh, vintage glasses. I'm wearing a button up collared t-shirt with a necklace and I have light olive skin. I'm actually a Canadian graphic designer from Hamilton, Ontario, which is situated on the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron Wanda, Haudenosaunee and Mississaugas. I've been freelancing for eight years and I focus on logo, branding, and front-end web development, especially in accessibility and inclusive projects. I'll pass you over to Helen for a wonderful introduction. Hi, I'm Helen. I use she and her pronouns. I have long black hair, dark brown eyes. I'm wearing a striped shirt and heart earrings. I'm sitting at my chair and my desk. I'm a disabled writer from Queens, New York. And you, welcome and thank you so much for being here. So before we get into accessibility in the design world, we need to have an understanding of disability and disability culture. So we're gonna give you a quick crash course in terminology. First things first, very shocking maybe, I don't know. Disability isn't a bad word. It's one of my favorite words in the language, actually. Um, I know people get very apprehensive when you're not a part of the disabled community on what terms to go and what things to use. But um, personally, I'm proud of my identity. I, and not everyone in the community might be on the same page with that. So we have different terminologies for each other as well. We're going to get into that in a second. But um, yeah, so don't be afraid to bring up different things. So we'll go into the next slide for help. Okay, so disability covers a broad range of conditions. It may have been a birth, caused by accident, or developed over time. And it can be categorized either by visible or invisible. Um, physical, cognitive, chronic conditions, or, or auditory or mental health conditions. So uh, visible and physical disabilities are uh, disabilities that you can immediately see because um, the person's using a mobility device or assistive device like a wheelchair, walker, cane. Um, when they walk, their gait might be a little different. So examples are cerebral palsy, muscle dystrophy, spinal bifida. Uh, cognitive disabilities is someone who has difficulty with mental tasks, um, such as autism, Down syndrome, brain injury, dyslexia. And invisible disabilities is not immediately apparent or visible from the outside, uh, like the image, uh, a picture of uh, Lauren Ridloff. She's a deaf actress from the TV series The Walking Dead. Uh, just by looking at her, you cannot tell that she's deaf because she, she doesn't have um, the hearing aids on. So uh, invisible uh, disabilities can be chronic, like debilitating pain or fatigue, brain injuries, learning differences, and mental health conditions. So some examples are fibromyalgia, or ADD, Attention Deficit Disorder, or depression. Okay, any questions? Okay. 
Okay, so um, there are two types of language used to do, to refer disability, uh, first person and disabled first. Person first language is considered by many the respectful way to refer to a disabled person because you're focusing on the person first and the disability second. Um, and it also means that having a disability does not lessen your personhood. So it was encouraged to use phrases like person with a disability, girl with autism, or boy who's deaf. It was adopted and heavily used by teachers, doctors, social service professionals. Everyone was told that they should only use person first language. But though it's designed to promote respect and acknowledges personhood, it also implies that disability or disabled are negative derogatory words and that disability is something society believes a person should try to separate from if they want to be considered a whole person. This makes it seem as though being disabled is something to be ashamed of. And disabled first, first language asserts that disability is a culture, um, an identity like race or gender. The choice is about empowerment and pride and that disability is nothing to be ashamed of or need to be overcome. Um, we are disabled because of society's barriers, not because of our condition. So some current accepted identities are disabled, person with a disability, deaf, hard of hearing, blind, low vision, autistic, wheelchair user, etc. Um, both are a matter of personal preference in the disabled community. So simply ask how a person chooses to identify. Helen, there's a question from Diego. Sure. You're on mute, Diego. <laughs> this is this is a story of my life. Uh, <laughs> um, a lot of this, a lot of this, like uh, questions are referring to like uh, visible disability. How can you use a person-first language when it's an invisible disability, uh, and when it's okay? Like I'm thinking about like more on the verge on the verge of like you know depression or other mental illnesses that they are not very apparent. Um, Jessica, yeah, I would love to take that one. So, identity language is very personal um, within the community, even with invisible disabilities. Not everyone might identify or want to identify as disabled or part of the disabled community. So there are gray areas in there. Um, as far as first and personal language for a disorder of some sort like ADD, you can definitely use like person with ADD or I am so-and-so, I have ADHD and actually label the condition that way. Um, but that's exactly why asking the person's preference as far as conversational is always important because they have a right to choose how they want to identify. Um, when on the whole, when you're describing the disabled community, um, or people with disabilities, those two are both acceptable ways of doing it. And to umbrella it under disability is perfectly acceptable. Thank you. My pleasure. All right, so um, we're gonna get into some other terms for you uh, because I'm gonna be using them a lot throughout this presentation. Um, so non-disabled is the current term that we use to define people without a disability. What I love about this and what people usually don't understand the perspective difference sometimes is that it really brings the disabled community to the forefront of the narrative. It's like, you know, you're non-disabled, you know, like this is our community. We're the majority here. We're the ones that feel like, you know, this is our livelihood. This is our environment. So a lot of people choose to refer to non-disabled people when speaking of the average human being. Uh, and organizations have also adopted this language to give disability a better platform and a central narrative. You'll also probably hear people use able-bodied to describe non-disabled people. Um, this was used uh, and referenced within the community as well, but I find it's very physically based. So a lot of physically disabled people use that. But personally, I find the focus on the 
body itself or that it's an able body still implies that there's like a hierarchy that it's above a disability so i tend to kind of avoid that narrative and it doesn't really um account for other forms of disabilities like autism or neuro uh, neurodivergent folks um people with syndrome and those sorts of conditions as well so i tend to use non-disabled and you'll hear probably a lot of people using that and then we have ableism now, ableism is the set of beliefs or practices that devalue and discriminate against people with disabilities. It rests on the assumption that disabled people need to be fixed and is actually heavily tied to the um, medical model of disability, which we will get to in a moment. Uh, it's the notion or ability that your ability equals value or worth. It's so intertwined in our culture uh, and it often forms harmful beliefs about disability uh, it often shapes how non-disabled people learn to treat disabled people throughout their lives and childhood. And um, it's also due to that people with disabilities aren't included for key decisions. Moving on to the next slide. So the medical versus social model of disability. These are the two umbrellas that we sort of categorize when we're talking about disability in the disabled community. So uh, Carol Jill, who is a professor in the Department of Disability at the Human Development and the University of Illinois in Chicago, believes that there is an overemphasis on the medical model. Um, it keeps people with disabilities from fully participating in society. And here we have a picture of Carol from Sharon Snyder and David Mitchell's Vital Signs, Crip Culture Talks Back documentary. Um, and they're sitting in their manual chair, wearing glasses, a turtleneck and pants. They have long hair and a low pending necklace. But I know that brings up the question, what is a medical and social model of disabilities? What are the differences? So um, the medical model of disability states that the person's disability is the problem and that it should be fixed in order for people to function in our normal, I put that in air quotes, society. Um, so the medical model believes that disability is a deficiency. It's something that's negative. Um, it's the individual's problem. It should be cured or fixed to conform to a non-disabled standard of living. Um, and that it can only be fixed by professionals in the medical community. Whereas the social model of disability is something that we have been adopting more recent in history, especially after, dis after the disability rights movement. And it states that society's inaccessible barriers are the problem and not a person's impairments or personal disability. Um, the social model believes that disability is an identity, just like gender, race, age, size. It's natural, not a bad word as we discussed, it's, it's neutral as well. Um, it believes that the problem is inaccessibility and inequity within our society, and that's what holds us back. Uh, it also believes that it's society's interaction with disability that needs to change outside their normal standard of living. So, um, you know, really learning about disability culture and learning a new perspective about the disability community. And finally, it also um, really puts disability-led solutions at the front and community care and that, you know, disability like we are our best advocates. We know everything about our disabilities. I have 29 years of experience having a physical disability. So, you know, that should be the forefront. And then that the professionals can help and assist us and listen to us and what we have to say about our own disabilities. Okay, that was a lot to talk, cover. Do we have any questions? There's a comment from Catherine. Catherine, do you want to share it? All right. Catherine has to unmute um, in order for us to hear. Or maybe not, she doesn't want to share. <laughs> Let us know if you want to share, Catherine. It's great. It's a conversation. No. 
No worries. Let's keep moving. Okay, so <laughs> moving on to the next slide, we're going to talk a bit about representation. So representation in the community is a very important way to learn more about disability and actually get a real life glimpse of our daily life. So um, there is a quote that was from the book of Nothing About Us Without Us, Disability, Oppression and Empowerment by James Charlton. So this slogan um, that was originally brought to James's attention by leaders of disabled people South Africa defines the ability, idea that no policy should pass without direct participation of those affected by that policy. I mean, how else are we supposed to help people in the communities without even knowing anyone in the community or what they go through on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, this really resonated heavily with the disability rights movement. Um, it was used to invoke policies to make things accessible. And we still use this today, especially even in the design world, to ensure that accessibility involves the lived experiences of disabled people. So off to the right here, we have an ad for the Crip Camp uh, Netflix documentary uh, video. Uh, so it's a vintage person in a wheelchair with another person behind them holding a guitar against a campsite background. Honestly, this is like everything you need to know or a great start about the disability rights movement. I bawled when I watched it. Um, it was the most authentic and raw representation I have ever seen about, um, you know, what we had to do to get to where we are now. And just to really see the feelings and the love and um, I'm getting emotional. And just everything is so beautiful about the disabled community. Um, and I highly recommend it. You know, it's a disability revolution directed by James Lebrant, uh, Lebrant I can't pronounce his last name. <laughs> and uh, it all starts from Camp Jeanette and it goes into the entire wave of disability rights movements from like the seventies and the nineties on. It, it's brilliant. So um, yeah, and with that, we'll move on to the next slide for Helen. <laughs> okay. So design with accessibility at the core. Um, People with disabilities have adopted this as a foundation to creating accessibility with us, not for us. So when you're designing uh, with accessibility, um, then you definitely need to be inclusive of the disabled community from the onset and remain integral throughout. Um, so let's see. First point, when accessibility is considered from the onset, it prevents costly modifications later on, which means when you design with accessibility and be inclusive from the very start, instead of as an afterthought, uh, you'll avoid having to make unnecessary corrections and adjustments later on. And the second point, which is inclusive of the disabled community from the onset, think of us as, um, as different lenses for you to filter your work through or design through so you can see it from different perspectives and then you'll have a better understanding of what works and what doesn't and then the third depending on the project at times you may have to step back and let the other lead meaning if the other person or community is more skillful or better suited for the project then you should give them lead. any questions So moving on to the next portion, um, authentic representation and inclusion. Uh, one in four adults live with a disability in the US and statistics are similar in Canada as well. Um, yet we barely are represented in the workforce, in Hollywood, in media. Um, there are systemic barriers and ableist assumptions that really make us less likely to be hired than the non-disabled individual, even with um, acts and human rights movements like the Americans with Disability Act in place. Um, you know, a lot of people don't want to put in that effort or don't understand that effort sometimes, so it can really um, hinder us from that. This can really only change by centering the narrative on disabled people. Um, Disability-led projects are often the most authentic media representations. Um, 
you know, we can't showcase the disabled experience without reaching out to the ones who are experiencing it. We're human, right? Um, and to have to say that is so bizarre, but you know, just like everyone, there's emotions. We're either sexual or asexual beings. Um, there, we have our own experiences, our personalities, our amazing intelligence and adaptability, you know? Um, and so the the key is is to involve us, you know, hire people with disabilities, um, consult with people on projects involving our community, um, even with accessibility, you know, get our experiences, um, showcase and support our work as well, you know, and include and, comp and compensate us for our contributions. So uh, to the right, we have a photo of the beautiful Hannah. Uh, in a wheelchair with their hands across their chest and celebrate this body is written across their chest in cursive. This is a disability led movement and also involves other people of marginalized communities too, which is wonderful. From this body is worthy and that's Hannah, the creator. And they celebrate, um, you know, bodies outside of societal norms. And it is some of the most beautiful photography I have ever seen. Um, so do we have any questions? Yes, Diego has a question. I have two questions. Uh, question number one is like, isn't there a law that mandate uh, to hire disabled people, uh, like as a percentage of the workforce or something like that? And I asked both questions, so it's really faster. Um, isn't it offensive to hire a disabled person just as consultant for their disability? Very great questions, thank you um, for them. And there are laws in place and human, uh, again, I am Canadian, so I do know that the American Disability Act covers a lot of these in workplace inclusion. However, there are often barriers um, within the systems themselves, as well as, you know, privatized businesses themselves on how they can choose or how they mask not hiring a person with a disability uh, you know, oftentimes putting things on res on requirements like must be able to lift 25 pounds for a job that does not require any lifting whatsoever, like putting that in a graphic design would be a way that they are legally allowed to decline someone with a disability when it actually has nothing to do with the requirements of the job. Um, and as well as your second question, um, token hires, you're right, you don't want to hire someone just because they have a disability. You don't want to um, just do it to check that box. The reason you're hiring disabled people and consulting with them on projects around disability is for our expertise, is for our years of knowledge, um, is for our adaptive way of maneuvering in a society that wasn't built for us for years. I mean, you know, before the 70s, you couldn't even go onto a bus. You know, schools weren't even integrated until the 1990s, which means I didn't, I was the first wave of students that was allowed to go to a school that was um, for everyone. And so when we look at those and what we had to deal with for so long, um, you're not hiring us as a token, you're hiring us so that we can give you our experiences and make things authentic and representation from the start. Thank you. No, I wasn't thinking about it as a token, but more as like, you know, like, you know, like, let's say, again, to your point, like, you know, like uh, an architectural project or like, uh, or like a design project, you know, hiring a person with disability outside skills. And again, it sounds harsh when I said it and probably is wrong, but I'm saying it anyway. Uh, outside the skills required for the project, right? So that's the things that I was like trying to point out, like how do you manage this, like paying somebody because you wanna be compensated, of course, and you want to compensate, right? A, a consultant, uh, but consulting just for your disability, can it, can it be perceived as offensive or not? It really always comes down to the way you conduct it, um, mm -hmm. there has to be an ethical way to do it. So, and it is entirely based on the reasons behind it. So 
For instance, if you're designing an app and you want to make sure that your app is accessible for someone who is deaf or hard of hearing, then it doesn't matter if they have a PhD to their name in deaf cultural studies or if they're an actual UX designer themselves. What you need to know is how is this actually going to function with someone who uses assistive technology or captioning or something that is specific, let's say, to the deaf community, then you're going to need to consult with the deaf community. So um, the best way to do that is to create like focus groups uh, is a way we've done it in the past in my design experiences. So uh, we offer whatever compensation you can within the budget, obviously, because there are different scales uh, and you actually take the notes uh, across the focus group and what people find is beneficial when they're using the product or what they found was not beneficial. Uh, and then to credit them for their comp like for their um, opinions and their lived experiences. And then you get an accessible app that can actually be used by real people who are deaf or hard of hearing. Great, thank you. I want to say, and I call it out, like Angela. I, Angela made a good point. If Angela, you want to like make it like for uh, for the group, that was a great thing. I think. Yes, I read that point. Please do, Angela. It's very exciting. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, you know, I just wanted to share that I think, uh, you know, we need to definitely keep these conversations going because, and making it like you know, known to people that at some point, even if you don't have a disability, at some point in your lifetime, you will, because as we grow older, we have different ailments and, you know, at, there can be an accident. And, you know, it's important to note that if people are not talking about this and thinking about this and making, you know, um, making sure that it's equitable and you know at some point we're all going to suffer so honestly that's so beautifully said um i love that theory too that's what i bring up all the time is everyone's going to become disabled at one point in their lifetime uh aging can be a an option where like you know not an option obviously happens <laughs> it's an option to age um but there are bodies. i wish it was an option i would say right now <laughs> right so uh, you know that happens we like lose our ability as time goes on um and you know non-disabled people just have that privilege and luxury of not having to deal with it until it happens whereas disabled people and you know accidental disabled like through accidents and things like that as well but um disabled people like this is their lived experiences every day you know it's what we're used to so yeah it, we're all in this and we're all going to have some form of where our body or minds might quote fail us at some point or not work the way we want them to anymore and that radical acceptance like you can learn so much from the disabled community because we're experts at that like that's my life expectancy was two and then it got changed to 60 overnight because they changed my diagnosis and it's just it's a wild ride <laughs> okay um, but thank you for that comment so much. That's, I definitely wanted to bring that up. So thank you so much. And now we're going to talk about accessibility. Uh, and you know, the whole fact that it is a standard of techniques. It is a um, different guidelines that can help, but it's also a conversation because it's, it's so personal depending on what the person's needs are or what their lived experiences are. So it really is a blend of disabled experiences and standard techniques that we can do to make things available to everyone. Um, so accessibility is the degree of which our environments, our products and our services are accessed by disabled people. It involves design solutions for various types of disabilities, such as visual, auditory, motor function and cognitive. So um, yeah, so here to the <laughs> right, we have a picture of eight symbols against colorful backgrounds for hearing, uh, a visual sign uh, for the blind or low vision folk, AD, which is audio descriptions, we'll, we'll get to all those, <laughs> sign language, uh, there is a person who is using a walking stick because they are blind, which is not also for every single blind person, just to note, <laughs> um, wheelchair user, 
closed captions, and a question mark. So moving on to the next slide, we're going to be talking about universal design versus accessible design. Okay, <clears throat> universal design was coined by Ron Mace, um, <clears throat> and it makes buildings, products, or environments accessible to all people, regardless of age, disability, or other factors. And it's made for all users and less expensive. Uh, it may not meet accessibility standards. And there are seven principal guidelines, which we'll get to later on. Um, accessible design is where the needs of people with disabilities are specifically considered. Uh, it meets certain accessibility standards like the ADA, um, and it should be inclusive of the disabled community for insights and experience. It may be pricier for a smaller market, which means that um, things designed for the disabled market are often uh, more expensive because they're not mass produced, whereas things catered to a non-disabled market are uh, priced lower. Okay, and here we have an example of a universal design product. It's the Purell hand sanitizer touch-free dispenser uh, with the person's hand underneath to show its function. It's made for all users, it's easy to use. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, okay. Uh, yes, next slide. Oh, is there a question? Okay. So here are the seven principles of universal design. Um, the first is equitable use, which means that it's useful and appealing to all users. For example, um, an elevator. Two, flexibility in use. Design can be used in more than one way, uh, like a height adjustable desk. Three, simple and intuitive. The, um, the design is easy to understand. So like an instruction manual with drawings. Four, perceptible information. Uh, the design communicates necessary information effectively to the user. So like braille on sign language for the blind. Five, tolerance for error refers to safety and trying to avoid hazards and accidents. So like uh, an undo button. Uh, low physical effort means design can be used efficiently and comfortably with minimum fatigue. So like automatic doors or automatic soap dispensers. And seven, size and space for approach and use. Uh, appropriate size and space is provided for approach. So uh, an accessible parking space. Okay, so here we have a nice looking adapted kitchen with a person in a wheelchair washing a dish at the sink. Um, so in this case, because it's considered an accessible design, it would need to meet certain ADA standards. And for those who don't know, ADA stands for Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, so you'll notice the sink, counters, and cabinets are lowered for easier reach. Uh, the layout is usually L-shaped because it's the most functional and adapted for uh, almost any space. There's a wide section of counter space, and there should be clearance space at the bottom of the sink and stove so a wheelchair user can pull up underneath. We have a question from Cassia. Do you want to share? Oh, um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, so this question is for either moderator. Uh, what are your thoughts on the sudden ability of industries to accompany disabled employees when they weren't able to months or weeks prior to shutdowns caused by COVID-19? Excellent question. Oh, I love it. Okay. I'm not going to lie. I was a little resentful. Um, you know, for years we've been hearing, oh, sorry, we can't do, um, you know, we can't do work from home scenarios. Uh, actually part of the reason why I didn't join a design firm, uh, and went freelancing was because there weren't many that offered me 
enough flexible hours that I could take a day off to recuperate or, um, you know, change my work schedule depending on how my fatigue was doing that day. And then all of a sudden, non-disabled people were like, how am I supposed to work from home? How am I supposed to do this? And everyone was like, no, it's okay. We got you. You can do this. So without being rude, it was kind of a bit of a backhand to everything we've been working for. Um, but you know what? I find people only know so much as their personal experiences sometimes. It's, it, it is hard to look outside of your norm, you know? And so if anything, I hope that what this does bring is better accessibility for the future and a better understanding of what disabled people have to go through, through isolation, through workplace accommodations, through all of these adaptable, wonderful technologies that we have to help aid us in this time and in the future. So I'm hoping that there's a light at the end of this for that. <laughs> I have a question about the previous slide. Why did you guys choose the crosswalk on the image on this uh, slide? Um, well, to show that the crosswalk, the, the stripes and also the curbs, uh, they're considered universal design. Got it. Fun fact was designed by a person in a wheelchair. I don't have the name on me right now, but that's another example of disabled people designing things because they're like, I need to get up this curb. How yeah. am I going to get up I need to see where to cross. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Okay. 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 So now that we've learned a little about the differences of universal design and accessible design, let's do a little exercise. You'll see uh, an image on the next slide. Do you think this is accessible? So this is an image of Robinson Square Path in Vancouver, Canada. It's a black and white photo of a ramp that zigzags across the stairwell. A person is sitting on a step. So we'll give you a few minutes to write your comments in and then uh, Denise will give us the overall and we'll reveal the answer. <laughs> I'm loving these. I'm living for this. <laughs> All right. I think we got a good okay. going. Most people are saying no. Okay. And you are correct. Um, well, some see this and they see the ramps and think, yes, it's accessible. And they like the design because the ramps blend into the stairs. Um, so let's see. This is actually considered a universal design. Um, and let's see what, why it isn't accessible. Well, first, there are no handrails along the ramps for support. So if, if I was going down the ramp or coming up the ramp or someone walking on the ramp, you need to hold on. They can't. Uh, second, there's no separation between the ramp surface and the steps merging into the ramp. That means if I'm going down the ramp in my wheelchair and it glitches and slips and I hit the step, with the steepness of the slope, I could easily just tip right over. And third, there are no contrasting strips to show the edge of the step. The stairs are all the same color, which makes it difficult for someone who is visually impaired to tell where one step begins and the next one ends. Yeah, and just to jump on that, because I don't, I feel like I have to. It's a Canadian thing. It's like this is all about. <laughs> I've even seen like don't feel bad because I've even seen disabled people who are like, this is so great. But a lot of people who say that have motorized wheelchairs, so you know we don't have to worry about that slope angle because it can handle it. Whereas someone with a manual chair, not at all. And it is, it's so beautiful. And the thing is, is that when it was made back in. Uh, well, to the code where it was made back from 1979 to 1983 was the code standards. It's technically accessible for that standard, like over 30, 40 years ago. 
Um, so it's outdated. And that's an example of where things need to be altered into the future. You know, um, we definitely have to look back on things and be like, what can we do better? Because this is a huge safety hazard for a lot of people. My chair did glitch once where my footrest went right into a wall because it drove sideways all of a sudden on me. Like, could you imagine the severity where there's no guide rail to stop me here? You know, it would be terrifying. Um, so there was even a proposal to provide an alternate method. Like, you know, to the side of these steps, provide an elevator so that if someone doesn't feel safe or comfortable and it's not for them, then they can have an elevator to go down this path rather than having to take the questionable stairway. And it can still be beautiful and useful for the people that can use it. And then it can be, you know, safety for people who can't. <laughs> Thank you for letting me rant on that. <laughs> Okay, so now I'm going to show you some examples of design inaccessibility. Next slide, please. Oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> okay. okay, so we have here the Hunter Points Library, which is newly built, state of the art building, uh, which I had the pleasure or not, depending on how you look at it, um, of visiting when it opened. And the first thing you see when you go in is the natural light. It's beautiful. There's like wood and then lots and lots of stairs. So one of the problems uh, in accessibility in this is the picture here on the second one where you see rows of bookshelves at different floor levels with a long staircase to the left. So this is not accessible by the one elevator that they have and it's only reachable by the stairs. And the library's response to that, that yes, the building is up to ADA code when they built it. And the solution for this was that anyone who needed books uh, in that area, they can just ask the staff and they'll go get it for them. Okay, so uh, what else? Also the, oh, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, the one elevator that they have, which is for all five floors, um, get really congested, and the wait time is like unbelievable. Uh, usually, it's like five or ten minutes, but when they have like uh, on the second floor, they have like uh, the children's department, uh, children's wing. Sorry. Um, when they have story time. So a lot of parents and uh, babysitters uh, bring the kids with the strollers and it takes up, you know, a lot of time for them to go up and down. And also the second floor where they have the elevator located, it's right in front of the stroller parking area. So it's like very difficult and it's like an obstacle course trying to get through that. And one of the highlights uh, they said was the Panoramic views of Manhattan that you can see out the windows, but yes, but you can only see it if you're standing on the stairs, so it's not accessible. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. Okay, uh, so here on the left, you have a concept sketch of the library's interior showcasing the multi level bookshelves that was done in 2010, and then on the right. You see the photo of the finished um, section, which was taken in 2019. So in that nine years, <clears throat> uh, no one thought about like the stairs or how to get in there <laughs> another way maybe. Uh, so there was no changes. Next. Do we have any questions on oh, the yeah, no questions, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, Emily, do you want to ask your question? Um, well, I, first of all, thank you for, I see that you're crediting the architects here because I was curious who did the design. Um, and then this is going back to something, I think in a, a couple slides ago, excuse me. Um, but I was curious, like if we say, you know, here's what, here's an example of successfully or successful design in terms of um, like accessibility and equity, like basically who, because 30 years ago, certain persons were left out of that. Um, like who are we not recognizing now? I'm, I'm just curious if you guys have a perspective on that. 
Yeah, great question. Um, oftentimes, like so much has moved forward and yet so much remains the same. It, it so depends on the industry you're talking about. Um, I find that physical disabilities get the highest amount of representation. Um, you know, making sure there's a ramp, making sure that the, you know, you can use the washroom, which is, this is all extremely valid and important things. I use it all the time. Um, but I feel like what's really left out in design, which we'll get to when we talk about accessibility and design more, is more of the cognitive disabilities or like how to approach, you know, um, the blind and deaf community as far as making the internet more accessible, which is funny because most like technology was originally built for people with disabilities. Like in school, I was always the one with a laptop because I got to use it in special privileges, but no one else did. Whereas now it's like, it's for everyone and it's not accessible, which is just, you know, mind blowing. So I personally feel like, um, you know, that sort of representation and that sort of disability spectrum usually gets ignored nowadays um, because we just think of the basic physical buildings when we're talking about accessibility. Helen, do you have anything you want to add? <laughs> I want to. I want to add something in a way that is like, although big cities like New York, right? If you get the subway, I mean, it's still far, far away to be like um, openly accessible, even to like you know, like physical disability. Like you have like fewer and sparse, like you know, like um, elevators. You know, like I think if you know, both for like, not just just uh, wheelchairs, but also elderly, you know, like it's very, very hard to access. And I feel a lot of big cities uh, are still like in terms of transportation and uh, public infrastructure are very much like, you know, behind on the physical, let alone the, the, the cognitive. No, you're so right. Um, and it's so funny because you would think the city, like there's so many ups and downs, right? Cities. Um, it's like a hit and miss. I went to New York for a few visits and a few projects and yeah, it was like, oh, I can't get off this stop until like, <laughs> like so many blocks and I have to like go backwards mm -hmm. where I'm going, or like alternate paths because it's always under construction. <laughs> um, whereas like rural areas or areas that aren't like the downtown core, like I'm up on the mountain where I live, let's say, it's not an actual mountain, it's an escarpment. But up here, our bus transit system, it's like, you have to wait 20 to 30 minutes sometimes for a bus to come in. And it's like, how am I supposed to even get to the accessibility core of downtown where they do sort of have more like crosswalks, more, um, you know, our bus system's pretty good here. So it's really relative of where you are. Um, but I can't even get there because the stuff up here doesn't care. <laughs> Okay, so thank you. yes, thank you for all of us. Um, websites, this is my jam. Uh, this is what I do. <laughs> so uh, for inaccessibility, uh, websites actually have to be at least A to double A compliant in order to be accessible. When I talk about compliancy, I talk about it in regards to the web content accessibility guide. We're going to cover that much later into the accessibility portion. Um, so A is a level essential for assistive tech to read or understand or operate a page. And AA is ideal support required for most public body websites. It is actually an ADA requirement by law not necessarily for the WCAG standard, but it is a legal requirement that websites have to be accessible. And here, happening in 2021 as well, and I believe in parts of the states as well, it is actually going to be a legal requirement for WCAG web compliancy. So it's an important thing to think about. So here, um, uh, we have a beautiful website example, uh, and it was listed as one of the 15 best modern design portfolios of 2020. Yet it is such major accessibility issues that affects its compliancy. So off to the right here, you'll see a screenshot of the homepage for Julie Bonomov's website. Uh, it's got a large organic blob color floating against a gray background that overlaps text um, as well. There's a peace sign in the top corner and a nav menu to the top other corner. Uh, moving on to the next slide, we're going to talk about why this website isn't accessible. And there's also another screenshot of another page, which is their portfolio page. Um, so the color contrast here is really off. Uh, it doesn't meet the contrast ratio. 
uh, which again, we'll get to in accessibility. So you can't really distinguish foreground elements from background elements and what's clickable, what's not clickable. Um, <laughs> illegibility. There are text elements here that we can see that overlap other text elements. However, the text elements in the background are links. So you actually need to be able to read what they are and hover over them, but they're not really accessed. Um, navigation here, we have, uh, I, I tested this myself because there's no way to really show it on a screen presentation, but um, navigation with a keyboard is when the entire interface of the site can be operated through a keyboard. So you can press the arrow buttons to scroll. You can tab through the hierarchy. So you can tab through the menu options, press enter, things like that. So this site cannot be read by a screen reader because the way it, or navigated with a keyboard, because the way it's um, set up and through its animations, it, it doesn't follow a familiar structure. It changes organically. So it's very hard for this tech to keep track. Um, and the structure, there's no coherent structural format or hierarchy. If you actually visit the website and you click on something, pages move across both axes, uh, axes, I believe. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it'll start from top to bottom, but then all of a sudden it'll move left to right or right to left, uh, with no indication of where you are on the site when you're navigating through it. So, um, that's a pretty hefty one. Do we have any website questions? No, we have a Facebook specific one. So we're Ooh. saving that for when you get to Facebook. Yes, you are all so ahead and on the ball. This is great. I'm so proud. <laughs> OK. So on to the next slide. We're going to talk about Facebook. Inequality. OK. So one thing that is supposed to be amazing, and it had great intentions, um, was that Facebook uses automatic alternative text. So this is. Uh, it actually uses an object recognition technology to provide you with a generated image description. Um, so in case, just a quick little thing, image descriptions or alt text describe the purpose of the image so that assistive tech can read it. Or even like neurodivergent folk or other folk can get like a good context of what the image is about. Maybe more like people who learn better through written rather than visual learners. So it's great for that. But as we can see here to the right, we have a picture of my beautiful pupper. But you wouldn't know that because if I didn't tell you that right now, Facebook would tell you that this image may contain people sitting dog indoor. <laughs> Close. <laughs> Not really. So this technology, the automatic te alternative text, it's great actually for um, text based images, it can read like paragraphs, like no problem. But it doesn't describe the complex images as accurately as a person can through entering alt text manually. So on the next slide here, you can see a comparison of the auto automatically generated alternative text to one that I created on my own. Uh, so the one that I wrote here was photo of a small white and brown dog looking to the right, sitting on a lounge chair in a hallway. As you can tell, there is no person in this photo. So I don't know where Facebook got that from, but, and it left out some key unique characteristics that can convey the feeling and the framework of the photo. Um, so I hope, I don't know, do we have another thing about Facebook that we wanna talk about on its inaccessibility that I didn't mention? Cassia, do you wanna share? No worries, we can go back if you feel like sharing. <laughs> um, so on to the next slide, we're going to talk about uh, inaccessibility for Instagram and Instagram stories. Uh, this one is a huge thing for me because we actually, they did have a thing where they met with model Jillian Mercado, who has a physical disability to talk about Instagram accessibility. And she sent out a tweet that asked everyone like, what is inaccessible about Instagram that you wanna change? Every single person. I was, was like, the stories aren't accessible. So right now there's no option for adding alternative text to any story content um, or audio descriptions or captioning, live captioning. So right now you actually have to manually apply your captioning with text. Um, or you have to use an external app to create your own videos, add in live captioning, add in audio descriptions on top of that which describe like the scenery of the place. It's usually in a monotone voice. You hear like this person entered a room and then it goes into the actual audio. 
Um, so uh, in order to make stories more accessible manually, we have to do it that way. So here you see a picture of deaf artist Chella Mann uh, who talks about before the 1973, people with disabilities had no access. And he's really big on accessibility, especially within the deaf community. And so other people like him, myself, so many others currently have to find our own unique way of manually making things accessible until Instagram kind of gets on that. Um, do we have any questions? Yeah, um, there's a question about TikTok and how accessible that is. TikTok, okay. I'm gonna base that off my very non, like I have a very general knowledge of TikTok. I don't use it personally. Um, so I don't have an experience with the interface so much, but I do hear that it is easier to add captioning onto content. I'm not sure if there's an auto caption function, but uh, from what I see from Instagram videos of TikTok videos, people add in a lot of their content uh, captions manually. Okay, so um, moving on to Helen. Okay, this is going to show you design and accessibility and inauthentic representation in the media. Um, this is a movie, Needle for You, a romance drama movie based off the book by Jojo Moyes. The character Will was in a motorcycle accident that left him a quadriplegic. Luis is hired as his caretaker. They fall in love, but it was a nut enough to save him from his decision of going through with euthanasia in the end. So this is one of the many films that misrepresents the disabled population uh, by exploiting the disability experience. The character Will is played by a non-disabled actor. Uh, his, his disability is portrayed as a tragedy and he couldn't be saved by his family or Louisa. These two examples are what we call inspiration porn. Inspiration point is a term coined by Stella Young for media's depiction of disabled people as victims, sources of inspiration, tragedy. And what's ironic to me is that the movie tagline was live boldly, which Will did not. <laughs> so that's, yeah, enough that in representation. Okay. Any questions? Next. Okay, now we're on to examples of design accessibility. Okay, this is uh, Billy's footwear, uh, which is one of the adaptive fashion. Adaptive fashion is just clothes and shoes made for getting dressed easier. Um, so the, his shoes features a zipper that opens the top part of the shoe so your foot can go into the footbed easily. There's no shoelace tying. Um, some other features in adaptive fashion are magnetic buttons, Velcro, sensory friendly materials um, that are tagless and seamless like fleece. Um, and some are reversibly worn where you can wear it either front or back. And there are more brands that can be found in the resources and links section, but just to name a few others, rebirth garments, they're like gender non-conforming clothes and accessories for all types of abilities, as well as uh, they do custom orders. IZ Adaptive, clothes for men, women, and non-gender. Zappos, of course, for shoes. And Tommy Adaptive by Tommy Hilfiger. Okay. All right, moving on to design accessibility, web accessibility checkers. Okay. So here is an example of one a company called AudioEye that has a whole suite of digital accessibility products and services for equal access, enhanced user experience, and sustainable accessibility solutions for businesses. One little nifty info too is that um, their advisory actually, their advisory board has a person with a disability on it as well. So you know that this company is actually having lived experiences when they're talking about their stuff. Uh, so this app screens and fixes WCAG errors in real time. Uh, and it is certified ADA compliance when you're building your site. So like off to the right, you can see three screenshots from AudioI website outlining their business model, their admin dashboard feature, helpful resources, and uh, their builder tool to show how it looks when you're actually fixing something in real time. 
There are some few uh, free checkers out there as well. Uh, you know, achecker.ca. There's the Wave Web Accessibility Evaluation Tool. And there's an entire guided checklist on the Ally website, a11y project.com and those are that one's in the resources as well uh and these will actually scan your current site and it'll actually give you like line for line coding of where the error is what the error is and what compliancy issue is there so that's a great start when you're talking about trying to see where your website is at with web accessibility standards i highly recommend them Next slide, we're gonna talk about uh, website development. So here is an example from Kai Prince. So his website's kaiprince.xyz. Uh, and he actually builds his site from scratch and then uses um, some plugins. And he even implemented a code that will not allow him to update his website if it's not a compliant feature. So he is brilliant and I love showcasing his work. Uh, he's a freelance web developer focusing on accessibility. His work is fully AA compliant, but also includes some AAA features. Some of his accessibility features include proper keyboard navigation and structure, a contrast ratio of, for text of five, four to five to one, which is the color contrast you need for low vision folk, uh, as well as just it's generally easier on the eyes as well when you're looking at things, so you don't have to squint. Um, all of his stuff has alt text and image descriptions. And there's legible font size and spacing here. So that also has like a 1.5 uh, leading height as well. We'll get into that in design accessibility. Actually, I have a bunch there. And uh, there are widgets to change the format, which we'll see on the next slide. Um, so here on the next slide, we have a close up of his accessibility widget, which is actually a plugin from UserWay. So the first widget allows you to actually let users custom customize the websites to their own uh, standards. So you can click the little button to make sure keyboard nav is on. So it'll like add a little outline while you're tabbing through all the content. You can have it read the page to you. So if you don't have a screen reading device, this can do it for you. Uh, you can increase the contrast. So if you can't visualize or difference things, it'll increase. Um, you can highlight your links so that people actually know where the links are. Increase font size, uh, in, uh, increase text spacing, pause any animations so that if like for people with epilepsy and things like that, if you actually can't have animation, uh, as well as people who are neurodivergent, um, it's often like distracting. There's a dyslexia friendly font that it can be changed to as well as cursor options and different tool tips to help you navigate the website. Another one that I love that he includes is adjusting your reading level. This is what people don't understand is actually really important for accessible design is your content needs to be understandable. You know, you should try to steer away from using idioms and things like that, that really make your, like, unless you're a legal site or a government site, there's no reason to have like 50 paragraphs to describe one thing, you know, it's too much. So he actually has a widget that will alter uh, the text from a grade 12 reading level to a grade 10 reading level to a grade six reading level. That way things can be comprehensible for everyone. And I really love that. Um, so websites again are kind of a big one. So does anyone have any questions before I jump into the next uh, topic? Yeah, there's both a question from Diego and from Angela. Diego, do you want to start? Sure. I was like, what is your take in general about online shopping? I think like, you know, uh, recognizing a product, what color, what size, what like, you know, style for like uh, people with like uh, with disability, what is the facility or easiness in, in uh, buying online now that we are moving towards an online world besides Amazon or these big ones, right? Smaller brands. Yes. So when we include every single dimension you can for the brand or like for the piece of article of clothing, let's say that you're buying, that would be a huge plus, right? I want to know exactly like how many inches underneath, you know, like the arm area, how long is it exactly? Like you got to get really specific with how it's used, the type of fabrics that you use, like explaining if there are any blends of anything. Um, 
So like I have scoliosis. So for me, like things never fit a medium. I'm, I have stuff from a small to an extra large in my closet just to fit my back. So um, if you can get really customizable with like, and descriptions too, like add descriptions of the model and what they're wearing, describe the garment to a T, you know, like if you're having a t-shirt, explain the color of the t-shirt, the brightness of it, what's said on the t-shirt, all of that. If you put captions involved in that too, it'll make, I think, shopping really easy. Um, Helen, do you have anything to add to that one about like adaptive stuff? Um, I didn't cover that. <laughs> okay. But, but, but do you find that a lot of do you find that a lot of brands are like doing it? No. Yeah, not really. Most things. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I know. Go ahead, Ellen. <laughs> yeah, not really. Um, I can't find any. <laughs> I mean, even even with uh, the adaptive one, uh, they're they're not, they don't show. I mean, they just show like. Uh, with the shoe open or the shoe, they, they don't actually show it with the shoe on the person, you know, to how it looks or how the person like can put it on or whatever. I think that would give a better uh, feel and, you know, people know how to do it. <laughs> Thank you. Angela, do you want to ask your question? Oh, sure. Um, I was just wondering if you knew, um, you know, let's say like for a starter company or a small business, um, generally, if someone wanted to start a website, how much does it cost to do either a review or to start it off from fresh as uh, an accessible website? Um, I think Helen made a great point in the beginning where is if it, you know, you don't have to fix it if it's if it starts off um, accessible from the start. So I was just wondering if you know how much it might cost to start one that is fully accessible. Yes, of course. Okay, so it obviously varies between um, the person's level within their business as well, right? Like, so you could hire like, uh, for instance, Kai is like a more of a junior developer, so he can do everything for a standard, but for probably more of a price for a startup business. Um, I'm just like double checking his personal one to see because it's usually, but you're right. If you start things off accessibility from the start, it's going to be cheaper because you're not going to have to pay for someone to audit your site and see how it's going. And then also provide an entire document of things you need to fix. And then you have to hire them on top of that to fix all of the things that you did. So I'm just waiting for it to load while I look up specific. I might have to get back to you in the chat with the specific prices. But no, that's, that's totally fine. I was just wondering if you knew um, from the top of your head, but that's that's totally fine. Um, I definitely think that, you know, it's something to consider. Um, I'm starting up a, a website and I want to keep this in mind. Yeah, of course. Um, so you definitely like, I know the rates are usually slightly more on top. So like, it'll be a standard web design rate. And then they usually add a little bit more for the hour for doing that. So it'll be like, maybe an additional $50 an hour to add the accessibility features on top of whatever their standard web prices are. Um, and mm -hmm. then consulting is usually like standard fees. So it'll be like this set price of let's say anywhere from I don't even want to say price because I don't want to undersell it for people. I, I'm, I'm yeah, a no, no, that's fine. Would you be able to share later just some um, good places to go for that kind of support? Yeah, that would be great. I can do that. Um, to, just to ask, would it be cool if I like did some research before when we send it out? That way we can like add it in there and I'll add it to the resources. Okay, great. Awesome. Okay, yes. Thank you so much for that question. All right, so moving on with the presentation, design accessibility, video game development. So I am not a video game designer. So like, this is just something I saw and was super excited and passionate about. Um, the Last of Us Part Two by Naughty Dog is arguably the most accessible game ever created. It, uh, even when it launches right from the beginning, it brings you to an options dialogue before you start the game. So users can switch everything and make them super comfortable for themselves um, before they even have to start the game. So you don't have to worry about missing content and starting it and not knowing what you're doing. Um, 
So it also begins with text to speak functions right off the bat. So every player can instantly understand. Uh, their features, they actually include some vision accessibility, like text to speech, uh, high contrast display, audio cues, things like that. Hearing accessibility, there are options for like indicators, pickup notifications, prompts. I'm gonna like bring you to the next slide too, because that's where you can see like, this is their menu. This is just an accessibility menu. It's beautiful. I mean, it's also options for the game as well, but it's just brilliant. Motor accessibility. So like you can lock on the aim so you don't have to actually like hold on to a button while you're trying to like, well, shoot someone in the game because that's the premise, but we don't go on violence here. <laughs> And uh, there's a camera assist as well, so that you don't have to like do the dynamic. I know motions was huge in games, but it was very inaccessible. Um, there's like automatic weapon swap, nav assist, so many things. Um, so this game is also just like the premise of the game, just so you know, it's like a second version to their first one where um, there's like a post pandemic world in the United States. like kind of funny that we're talking about that right now but um and so they've settled down into like their areas and then a new violent event happens which disrupts the peace and they have to go like back on this adventure so it's like a role play game and like a live action kind of game and you have to like go through all these prompts and like it, it even provides like little tips so if you don't know how to progress in the game it'll help you progress in the game which i find super awesome um there's also like slightly little other things that are accessible in gaming right now, like the Xbox One. If you search that up, there's so many accessibility options in that controller. Uh, Nintendo Switch just changed their configurations for their controller so that you can customize any button to be anything you want. Um, and there's options to turn off motion gaming now, which is fantastic because one of my biggest upsets with the Wii was that I couldn't use it. And I tried to play Dance Dance Revolution and it kept calling me lazy because I literally strapped the controller to my wrist and tried to like fling it into the air to move. <laughs> and it didn't pick up on any of the motions. <laughs> I was really glad when that changed. <laughs> um, do we have any questions on gaming at all before we move on? <laughs> no. Okay then. We're gonna bring it on to Helen. Okay. So this is representation in literature. Um, only books publishes stories um, written only by disabled writers um, because he seeks to expand representation of disability in literature. Um, disabled writers and talent are still not included enough in the, in the publishing industry. Um, a 2019 Publishers Association survey found only 6% 6 6 of the workforce identify as having a disability, and there aren't any available statistics on disabled authors. So when we look at books published about disability, the majority are written by non-disabled writers like Georgia Moyes, Before You, and books with inaccurate portrayal of disability only continues the negative stereotypes. That's why it's so important to have disabled people writing and telling their own stories. But it's also important for the book publishing industry to hire and create more accessible and inclusive space in positions of leadership, like agents, editors, critics. They shape how readers view disability as well as whether disabled talent is promoted or ignored. Okay, and here we have an authentic representation in film. Uh, this film is give, uh, give Me Liberty. It's based on the director's experience as a medical transport driver. Uh, he's running late because of all these obstacles he encounters along the way. The character Tracy, played by Lola Spencer, is one of the passengers on the ride trying to get to work. So in this movie, Tracy's disabled character was authentically cast, but most importantly, her storyline didn't revolve around her disability. She had a life, she was a social worker, she's sassy, she takes care of her family, all these different things, and she just so happens to be disabled. Um, the narrative gave everyone an even playing field. There was no heroic figure, no victim, just all these different characters and their experiences brought together by this journey. And, okay, any questions? Next. Nope. 
Okay. Mm, and here we have uh, the presentation in media. Here we have Alice Wong on the cover of Vogue UK as part of their global theme of hope. They featured 40 activists and Alice was a good for her continued advocacy and dedication of both on disability media and culture. So Vogue UK said everyone uh, featured individual images and this is Alice's. I wanna I wanna add like a, a quick comment that like Vogue UK mm -hmm. editor in chief is Edward Enninfo and is like the first black editor in chief in Vogue and an amazing person. Uh, so I think everything that is happening on Vogue UK is in terms of representation, right? Is because he is pushing hard into like representative all sorts and all breadth of thing, all breadth of people yeah, on the cover to give space. Uh, because I think he feels that he's the first person doing this, you know, in history of Vogue. And it's sad saying that in 2020, but it's also like uh, able for the first time to push onto a fashion magazine, something like this. And is amazing, you know, what is happening. So I think the context, I'm saying that because of context of like, to your point, Ellen, people in charge, right, of the publishing house. Uh, if people in charge understand what the representation means, they are more keen to publish an author or to feature people, you know, like that is create like a better representation versus if you have the same, the same, same, you know, like in position of leadership, is more difficult to get uh, to get along in that side. So, okay, here's the actual cover spread open, uh, featuring twenty of the forty activists. Sounds like a fold down. <laughs> Pretty cool. Actually, and we've hit the action part. This is. Um, a little bit of what we can do in our everyday design lives and to make things accessible. A quick disclaimer though, you know, we don't have to feel overwhelmed here, right? This is a start. This is a stepping platform. I'm an expert in my field from what I've done, but I've also become an expert in my field because I've followed other disabled activists, designers, writers, like there's like the Black Disabled Creatives database that is just filled with beautiful disabled representation and people to hire and things like that. Um, the first thing I ever learned about accessibility was at alt text because of a Tumblr blog, because a friend of mine was <laughs> deaf and I would read their content and then they would add image descriptions for the blind. And I was like, oh my gosh, it makes so much sense. So like everyone is an authority in their own perspectives of it, you know? So don't be afraid. We all start somewhere and um, what works for some might not work for others. And that's what I love about the disabled community. We come together, we say, what worked for you? Okay, what worked for you? Oh my gosh, what if we did it this way? Like we're just experts at adapting. And I think if you really plug in to the disabled community, like even if you check out half my Instagram people I follow, you will find a whole network of people. And I can offer some later if we have questions later on. But um, yeah, so let's, you know, there are little things that we can do for sure. And we're gonna get through them now. So graphic designers. My fellow people, um, here are <laughs> two points in which we can make our designs more accessible. Um, you know, we should use a color contrast ratio in text of four to five to one. And for graphic elements, like uh, a box on top of another box or things like that, where there's no actual readable text, the ratio only has to be three to one. Uh, there's some explore for a contrast checker down here. So that will give you like a good example to see what your colors are at. Um, use legible fonts that are easy to read. That includes text spacing, like with a line height of 1.5 the, times the font size, paragraph spacing two times. This is on the website accessibility guides. A lot of design kind of overlaps with web design too. Um, letter spacing should be 0.12 times the font size and word spacing should be 0.16 times the font size. Um, you know, use, don't try to steer away from uppercase, italics, or decorative fonts for large copy. It's not easily read. 
Uh, and though there is some things to say that serif fonts are good for like books, uh, for digital web display, it's much better to have a sans serif for large bodies. Um, use clean and concise layouts with a hierarchy. We all know this, you know, our headings, our subheadings, our body content, we can separate these, make sure there's a lot of padding and negative space to kind of section things nicely. Uh, use plain language, you know, grade six to eight reading level in your content so it can be understood by many people. Use alt text and image descriptions in your documents as well as your social media posts. If you're posting digitally, you wanna make sure that everyone can know what you're doing. Uh, and of course, hire and collaborate disabled designers for authentic imagery, illustrations, or stock photography. Like so many times, we as designers, we often outsource things anyway. We're like, oh, so and so is a good animator. Let's get them to do this. So why not outsource for oh, so and so draws these beautiful people in wheelchairs, and they're disabled themselves. Let's hire that person to give us some content. You know, um, another good one to reference is designing for accessibility, which actually provides a whole do's and don'ts for designing for different disabilities uh, from the UK government, actually. And you know, so it talks about like how to design for autism, for screen readers, blind or low vision folk, deaf or hard of hearing, physical disabilities, dyslexia, and it has it all in a beautiful graphic that's easily understandable. So that's a huge one. So off to the right here, we could see like a little person with a scale and they're not happy because the contrast ratio is not enough. In the first one, though we might be able to think it's enough, it's not that four to five to one ratio. Whereas the second one, they're super happy because that's more legible and it's easier to read. And web developers. Um, so for website development, you are going to follow the WCAG 2.1 guidelines, which is the Web Content Accessibility Guides for AA compliancy. I know it's a lot to read. It's a lot of um, heavy content. I'm actually currently secretly working on a simplified version of it that I'm going to be providing probably within the next few months. So it'll really break down each level of compliancy and what that means on a web design. Um, so, and you can link back to that too. So looking forward to that. Um, we use HTML5 structure, you know, don't do silly CSS hacks that are gonna affect the formatting like too many, um, you know, absolute fixes or, or um, fixed content. Um, this site should be navi uh, navigatable. I think I made up the word. By <laughs> screen readers. <laughs> um, use labels for forms, not placeholder text, because the actual assisted devices will read out the label where it doesn't always read out the placeholder text. So it might look nicer, but it's not really that accessible. Uh, for user interface or user experience, apps, et cetera, you know, consult with disabled people. We talked about um, doing focus groups, things like that, so that you can see how that device is going to be used by people with disabilities and you can make sure it's accessible right from the start. And um, a little small one is use camel case hashtags. Uh, so that's when you actually capitalize every word in your hashtag. This allows assistive technology to actually read out the words or else they're gonna think it's one giant word and not know how to pronounce it. Um, so that's a little one that you can do. And shorten your URL links, you know. Uh, it, it, there's some free online, if we Google it, that can actually just shorten a link so that the screen reader doesn't read out all of the like, you know, D slash 12 QM, all of that junk. <laughs> we don't want that involved. Um, okay, so. Does anyone have any questions on uh, web design tips? Can I ask a question, Jessica? Yes. Um, I'm curious, I saw also in your Instagram feed that even though there's the option of doing the alt text, which I'm just gonna guess that you filled out, you also write the ID at the bottom. And I'm just wondering why you have both. Yes, great question. So I like to provide both and do it actually differently. So the alt text I write is a very basic what the image is. So if it's a picture of a dog, I just write photo of a dog. Uh, whereas the ID goes into a little more depth that talks about like maybe some background elements, maybe some specific things that make that photo unique. Uh, because including it in the captions is also good for people who prefer to learn by reading rather than visually. So if they need help processing the content of your image, having it in the captions really helps people on all different scales to get a, a better understanding. Um, some people also do dynamic captions. So they'll actually sort of talk about the picture in their paragraph anyway, which means you can do an 
a shortened image description because you've already described its purpose. Thank you. Oh, thank you for asking. Um, okay, so we are going- Can I, ask a question? Can I jump in? Yeah. Sorry, hello, hi, I'm dialing in from Australia. Uh, I have a question where we're having, um, we're currently making our website AA compliant, um, but there's also a balance where we have a lot of promotional graphics that are connected to sort of existing stories that come in from social media or wherever it might be. And we're getting a bit of pushback, and I'm just curious of the of your opinion on if we have descriptive text to describe the visual that has promotional text on it, is that appropriate? Do you think that that covers all areas, or do you feel that it is best to not have any any visuals on the any text on the visuals? If um, that makes sense. Yeah, that totally. So I'm assuming yeah, 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 yeah. pictures with text on top, like there's text in the image, so whether to add that in the description, right? Yeah, well, we've got, so essentially we'll have um, artwork, which will have say $10 promotion or whatever it might be for your phone or $10 off the phone. And we're being asked to remove that and only have it in live text as mm -hmm. uh, my feeling is if we have both and a description of what's in the image that that should cover all bases. But yeah, I was just after. Okay, yes. I see. So as far as web accessibility standards, um, they do suggest that you should steer away from image on text when you can just put it in text. So like to remove that promo completely from the website, you don't need it because you're typing it in the website. Whereas if you're doing an ad on social media for that $10 off sign, you can definitely add it in and then add it to anything you put text on an image, you have to describe it in the image description. Uh, but as far as the website AA standard, um, it suggests that you're better off putting it in like important content in actual text and not bothering putting it in images in the image okay yeah i was just sort of my feeling is a little bit that the image has a lot of impact for um i guess from the able side of things and it connects to the story so if we're covering both bases would that be acceptable but it sounds like it's probably preferred not to do that for extra i guess screen reading and things like that because mm -hmm. then you run um, the room yeah right yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah okay thank you Thanks. Thanks so much for the question. There's another question, Jessica. Angela is asking where we can get tips on how to write descriptions for alt text. Wonderful, yes. Angela, you were asking the great questions. Okay, um, so I actually have a resource on my website under jessicaod.com slash resources. There is a wonderful person, uh, Veronica with four eyes, and they are low vision and they offer a full range of examples and just and like resources on how to write image descriptions for different industries. So like specifically how to do photojournalism image descriptions versus, you know, something in design. And that's where I learned a lot of mine from. There's also an open uh, Facebook, like there's a few Facebook pages that you can go under that actually offer community-based image descriptions. So people can like rely on each other to add image descriptions um, if you're having trouble doing it. No problem. Okay. So moving forward, we're gonna get into photography. Um, so in your photographs, it's obviously important to add the alt text and image descriptions. Um, avoid inspiration porn narratives for capturing emotions. Like we're very over that sunset picture of the person sitting in the wheelchair with their arms up in the air, like loving life because their life is so brilliantly fulfilled. Um, no, that was like so 2000s, we're over that. <laughs> we want raw content, we want real content, you know? Uh, and a way to get that is to like actually represent disabled people and in their individualities, you know, hire disabled models, Jillian Mercado, Erin Phillips, like there are so many amazing models out there that um, we can hire and photographers as well, like Tristan Marie Photography uh, has a disability and creates the most just moving photos around her disability, it's gorgeous. Um, also cover a variety of disabilities, you know, it's not just a person in a medical chair or a manual chair, um, you know, cover people on the spectrum, invisible, invisible disabilities, which means hiring people with invisible disabilities because there's 
no way to actually know in the picture unless you actually have that model. Um, you know, Down syndrome, like there's so, like our culture is so diverse and there are so many different stories and intersections along with race, age, gender on top of being disabled. Like why not, right? Cover everything. Um, support disabled models and photographers by hiring them, consulting with them on shoots. If you're going to do a shoot about disability, you need to have actual disability representation in there or else it won't come across as authentic. Um, so to the right here, we have a photo of a person in a short dark brown hair reclined in their chair looking up with closed eyes as it's raining. The photo source is from Bexday, they don't know. It's for the repost issue 12. So one thing about that photo shoot, it's an actual set of portraits of people with disabilities from across the UK. And it highlights the impacts of a decade of government austerity and budget cuts towards disabled people. And that's how they represent it through these people's photos. Okay, moving on to videographers. Um, so this one's kind of content heavy, so I'm glad that we're gonna like cover it like later in the resources uh, for you to take home, because uh, it's probably a lot to go through now. But we want to provide closed captioning on all videos for those who are deaf or hard of hearing. Captions are also great for those preferring to read again rather than listening to content. So it offers that extra layer of sensories. Uh, provide audio descriptions for those who are blind or visually impaired. So like the setting of an area needs to have an audio description so people know where they are in a room um, or what the setting is and the backdrop is for the video. Um, transcripts are also recommended for, which is a text document describing all the audio, including timing, ambiance, setting descriptions, and captions for speech. So having this option, I even used it on a couple seminars where I missed the seminar or I couldn't pay attention to the seminar very well. So I read the transcript later because I didn't feel like watching an entire video as well. So it's really good. Um, if your video is purely decorative uh, and doesn't contain vital information, just make sure users are aware of that in another way on text on websites. Like this is the purpose of the video rather than since there's nothing to caption and things like that. Um, ASL, American Sign Language, or BSL, British Sign Language, interpretation should be also considered when capturing an, uh, live events and recordings. Uh, it's an entire language within itself, and there is such a cultural attachment to it in the deaf community uh, where it's exclusive. You know, people may prefer sign language over captions. Some people might prefer captions over sign language. Um, and hire interpreters who are deaf. There are plenty of deaf interpreters and signers that don't get the opportunity to get the job because someone's hiring an ally or someone who has equal experience, maybe, but they just don't have that lived experience. So that would be something that you can do as well. And there's an explore on making audio and video media accessible bottom there for you later. And moving on to Helen. Okay. So when you're writing about uh, disabled people or you're interviewing them, be mindful of stereotypes and phrasing subjects as victims or inspirational. Uh, educate yourself with the latest terminology, research, and consult. Uh, always ask the individual's identity language preference and ensure you have access to authentic disability representation for stories. And Kenny Fry is a disabled writer and he created a set of questions to consider for non-disabled fiction writers uh, when writing about disabled characters. Uh, does the work have more than one disabled character? Do the disabled characters have their own narrative purpose other than the education and profit of a non-disabled character? And is the character's disability not eradicated either by curing or killing? Um, another source that's very good is disabledwriters.com. Uh, it helps editors connect with disabled writers and journalists as well as journalists connect with disabled sources who are professional or educational experts in their field. And Disability Visibility Project is um, <clears throat> founded and run by Alice Wong, who we saw on uh, British UK cover. Uh, she's, uh, she has a lot of connections and she consults. So if you need any like uh, resources or, uh, you know, need to connect with, uh, disabled writers or journalists, then you, know, you should check out her site. She has a lot of information. That's it. And that's it. That concludes 
our presentation. It's so amazing. Thank you. Woo amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Do we have any other questions before we sort of wrap? Or a comment that you want to share, anything that you want to share? Yeah. Oh, what kind of writing do you do? Um, right now I do uh, basically fiction. Um, I have a few ideas <laughs> and a few projects in mind. So I'm just gathering information and doing a little research first. I don't think so much. I don't think so much. Helen, talk about the two books that you wrote. <laughs> oh. <laughs> My first book is a memoir. Um, it's about growing up with disability in an ableist society. Um, I wrote it because I was uh, very frustrated. I was very, um, it was hard. I had a lot of internal ableism. <laughs> uh, yeah, because growing up, you're told, you know, in an Asian culture, especially, um, you know, where disability is not really accepted, um, you know, so you're being told, oh, you know, like, when we go to like a wedding or something, you know, don't bring your chair, it wouldn't look right in the photo, you know. So <laughs> I had a lot of anger, you know, and I wrote that to kind of let out the anger and also to maybe whoever wrote, uh, read it, you know, would understand a little better, you know, because a lot of assumption was, oh, you're in a chair, you know, life is fine, you know, um, what do you have to worry about? You have people doing things for you, you know, and which is so not the case because I had so much responsibility on not just for myself, but for my family. So, you know, just to show that, you know, it's not just about the disability, you know, I have a life outside of that. So, and my second book is, um, is a young adult. It's perfect. It's fiction. And it's about, um, a girl who is abused. Um, and she finds a family. So. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I like, uh, I was, I was, uh, I wanted to add the fact that it's like, you know, again, we discussed during the preparation on how, you know, there is still more work to do, but how there is more representation in shows that is like, uh, that like Rami or other, or other like shows that represent like, uh, people with disability, um, with a full life, including a sexual uh a sexual representation of their life like there are people and jessica you know I, I, you were like um saying you were saying that i i, I give it to you because it, the, your reaction was really nice in in terms of like representing people as with a full life and not just from the disability part yes exactly right um and it's also extremely valid that um you know, disabled people can be asexual as well, just like any other person. We all have our different identities, so, um, and sexualities, and that's the thing. It's like, even growing up, I, I never understood that society didn't see those things. I was very, I don't know, I don't know if my parents just gave me full authority and, and advocacy autonomy, but and I also benefited with having a sister with a disability. So we often like, that was our normal reality, you know? Like a lot of our lived experiences, we saw representation in each other. Um, and then as you get older and kind of hit through that like awkward stage of like puberty, figuring out yourself, dating. I mean, I mean, this is honestly getting into like a whole, like we're gonna do an accessibility after dark conversation because <laughs> positive group about disability on Facebook. So, um, but you know, we talk about those sorts of things and the nuances and, the, and, and then we all start to develop ourselves and, and you know, we question those things because other people don't see us that way all of a sudden. And it's like, wait a minute. I thought the only difference between me and someone else was that like, I, you know, yeah, so what? I can't do this. Or like, but walking is overrelated anyway. Like, you know, I never understood those little 
differences that society didn't see. And, and as I got older and connected with the disabled community more, it, I just saw the beautiful representation in like Rami where actor Steve Way, you know, has a whole scene about that with his uh, co-star Rami. And, you know, they talk about those sorts of things or like Jillian Mercado in, um, oh, I have like the notes here, I believe it's Generation Q. The L word, Generation Q, you know, Jillian McCarthy was a model in that show. And just like seeing that authentic representation in media and you get excited and bubbly and you're like, yes, that's it. Like, that's me. I, that's everything that's happened in my life too. And you can relate to all of it. Like we're, we, we're, we're like everyone. And I feel like that's such a weird thing to say because we all know our own experiences, but your normal might not be my normal, you know? And I, I like highlighting those differences and, you know, advocating for them and shoving them in people's faces because some people <laughs> I overexposed to it because I'm like, look at all the things we are. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so yeah, like this was a lot, right? We did a lot and we know we only merely scratched the surface on this topic. And there's so many things that we can uh, dive into. Um, and uh, Jessica and Helen has put together a massive list of resources um, that we will share with everybody um, after um, after this. Um, so uh, like I, like Denise mentioned um, and Crystal dropped in the um, chat that we will be sharing a transcript of this session along with the presentation that uh, we put together that you we just took you through. Um, uh, through our newsletter. So if you haven't signed up for our newsletter, please go on our website and um, and I think uh, Crystal probably will drop it in our chat again. Um, but yeah, let's give a round of applause on mute and give a round of applause to Helen and Jessica. Um, and we thank you to all, everyone here for spending the evening with us and sharing, sharing your questions and your comments. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Everyone. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. And Emily, for to your point, uh, you can share it with other people if you want. Like, I, I feel free to share it with other people that you know needs or yeah. wants or are interested in this presentation. This is yeah. I, I'm so grateful because I'm working with a web developer right now, and I feel like I need to get this to him right now. About and I did. Um, really quickly, want to share that my mom um, teaches. She's a special education teacher, adult for adults, and um, her students have. They are really high functioning, cognitively impaired. And please catch me if I'm not using appropriate language. Um, but I'm so excited to share this with her because she's been teaching for since the '80s, and this is such a contemporary progressive like really refreshing presentation and i like i'm like you said you're excited to you know shove these truths and experiences in people's face like i can't wait to make her like talk through this all with me and to just i think get to know her students um better through y'all's wisdom so thank you so much wait awesome. let's say for a second lucy you were talking about like tests uh, talk about the text that you were like talking about in your comment. I, I didn't understand and maybe we can talk about it a little bit. Probably are muted. I think she's figuring it out. Is that Cassie, did you say? Mom, it's Sorry. on the bottom <laughs> bar. It's the no. microphone. No. There you go. Hello. <laughs> Am I there? Yeah, yeah yes. you're here. Talk loud though. Oh, talk louder? Okay. Oh, I was, um, I am also, I'm an educator and, um, I work with kids in grades through three through five. So I love hearing what you're saying. So I've been in schools for over 20 years. So obviously there's been a lot of good changes. Um, my comment Diego was about, um, the plethora of standardized tests that American children have to take. And while I can't comment on the validity of the testing, one thing that we that I've seen that's been a huge change was um, I was just referring to that graphic about the widgets so that kids, when they're working on their laptop, their Chromebook, they can enlarge the font. They can make deeper spacing. They can highlight. They can add tools. They can get definition. Um, it's really empowering.
for them to be able to manipulate text or they can get text to talk, talk to text, um, which has just been a huge change for testing. But what I love to see about that, that now we know we can do that universally for testing because it's really required and enforced by ADA, that that should really be accessible to kids with all kinds of reading material, not around testing. Just we know if we can do it, let's do it for all kinds of text um, and reading for for starting with really early readers. Yeah. Thank you. That's a brilliant point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Emily, to go over um, what you're saying too, first of all, that's uh, that's amazing. I'm so excited for you to talk to your mom about this. Uh, yeah. The little thing too, uh, and this is something I recently learned. So I follow the autistic acts on Instagram. They are adults living with autism and they are fantastic. And the autistic cats. So like literally like, you know, like the Aristocats, but it's cats. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So um, you'll see them on my follower list as well on Instagram. And uh, one thing they recently brought up that I really, that really stuck with me is that we are no longer really using terms like high functioning, low functioning, etc. You know, um, autism is an entire spectrum. And uh, when we put that hierarchy of function, it tends to like, gravitate towards an abled narrative of like, in comparison to a neurotypical person, you can function like us versus you can't. When like the actual nuances and beauty of neurodivergence and like the way they process things that like are probably much better than the way we process things is, uh, so yeah, that would be like a current example. Awesome, thank you very much for clarifying that. I think if there are no other comments or question, we can uh, wrap. And uh, thank you for everyone that came from everywhere. I'm excited to have an Australian, <laughs> multiple, two Australians. Uh, one has to leave early because she was still working. It's incredible. So this is like the beauty of the digital and Zoom world. While well, we can be all in the same room and chit chat and share, we can expand the audience to other, uh, and we have people from Ohio, from all sorts of like, you know, like uh, places, uh, Connecticut and Washington. So it's really beautiful to have like uh, participation from everywhere and not just in the same room. So that's great. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you, y'all. Thank you. Thank you.